Um, I will be talking about um, Iovance. This is a company that is doing T cells. This, this order of presentations have been very well selected, and I thank our organizers for doing that because uh, thank you for uh, covering a lot of ground that I don't have to repeat sort of that landscape. Um, during the course of this presentation, I will certainly be making forward looking statements. Um, from a corporate perspective, we are a cell therapy company. We use the autologous patient product, it's the T cells from the location of the tumor, and we use that for treatment of solid tumors. We are interested in multiple indications, including metastatic melanoma, cervical, head and neck, non-small cell lung cancer, as well as others, such as uh, combinations and earlier line um, indications. We have worked very extensively on our manufacturing process. This particular technology initially was developed by Steve Rosenberg at MCI, and so we have optimized the process extensively into what we call now fondly generation two manufacturing. It is a 22-day manufacturing process, and it allows for a cryopreserved product to be shipped to the sites. Uh, the probability of success on the manufacturing is well over 90%, so we have very much optimized the process itself, and we are able to produce tills very successfully. We do have a number of collaborators that we work with, both academic as well as industry collaborators, including MD Anderson, Moffitt, um, MedMU, National Cancer Institute, of course, NIH, Ohio State University, and Roswell Park. Um, so why TILS? What, what is it that we are interested in? Um, to remind ourselves, in the past you know, a couple of years, we have actually seen cell therapies come to market for heme malignancies. It has been an outstanding ride to see cell therapies move into reality as far as uh, treatment of uh, diseases and heme indication. But at the same time, as just shown here, is that heme is about 10% of the entire globe of oncology indications. So solid tumor is something that although checkpoints have made great progress in offering solutions to the patients, we want to be thinking about what else can we do? Can cell therapy have a, have a play in this space? And particularly once patients progress on checkpoints, what do we do with them now? So what we are interested in is we have uh, licensed this technology from uh, Steve Rosenberg at NCI. We work very closely with him continuously. And we are interested in the solid tumor bar, which is shown in the green in that cycle uh, in terms of targeting, although we also have a program in heme indications as well. In terms of uh, therapy overview, what, what is TIL? TIL is right now is an unmodified, genetically unmodified cells that we are extracting from the site of the tumor. When a um, tumor is detected in the body, our immune system reacts. It brings cells to the site of the tumor, and they're um, typically successful, which is why we don't walk around with tumors at age of 20, but in rare cases, when the patient starts their immune system weakens or the, uh, the mutational load is very high, ultimately tumors develop. The T cells, however, did their job. They come to the site of the tumor and launch an attack. The tumor hostile microenvironment blocks the activity as well as the fact that the mutational landscape is very active. So what Rosenberg had figured out was that if we take these tumors out and we extract the T cells that came to the site of the tumor, those T cells recognize the neoantigens present at the tumor. And one problem with solid tumors has been the diversity of neoantigens. There's a lot of different clones present, there's a lot of mutations, and so our approach is, okay, if there's a lot of different mutations, we need to have a polyclonal product to address all the mutations. So what, um, according to the Rosenberg um, process, we, we, we can see responses, deep responses in metastatic melanoma after one time therapy. He also has shown that there's responses in cervical cancer as well uh, and, and after one time therapy. And what is nice about using the T cell as a whole, which is our own autologous T cells, is the potential to establish immunological memory. These T cells circulate over time and every time they see a tumor, they get overexpressed and they fight the disease. In terms of the process itself, as shown here, uh, we start with taking about a cube, a, a centimeter cube of a tumor from the patient. We then send that off to our central manufacturing um, locations where the tumor is fragmented, it's placed in media, and the T cells are allowed to leave the tumor. At that point, we go through a two cycles of growth, which as I noted before, it's about 22 days. Um, and we allow for growth of cells that are about a billion all the way to about 150 billion. Um, that product is then washed, frozen, put in a bag, and that's shipped to the patients. Before the patient receives their product, they're lymphodepleted by cyclophosphamide fludarabine to remove the hostile microenvironment and allow for the T cells to have their best chance of success. Um, once the product is infused, we follow by up to six doses of IL-2 to allow for the cells that are newly uh, infused into the patient to proliferate and survive. 
Um, this slide is actually a comparison between uh, checkpoints, TCRs, CAR Ts, and TILs. And I just wanted to highlight the fact that TILs are for solid tumor. They are polyclonal, and that's the differentiation between uh, different other T cells that are present. This is very polyclonal. There's a lot of different clones that are present, and currently we are not genetically modifying the product, although we are looking into that as next generation of TIL. Um, this is where really this, the data started. This is old data from Dr. Rosenberg at NCI. And what was really interesting about it is about 22 to 24 percent of patients that have gone into a CR, and if you, I don't know if you're able to read the x-axis, but it goes out to about nine years of follow-up. So patients that go into a deep CR, they manage to stay in CR for years and years at a time. What is different here, however, is the patients were not exposed to prior anti-PD-1. We now know that if the patient has received anti-PD-1, their immune landscape might have changed. And so that response rate is a little different in case of subsequent therapy, subsequent anti-PD-1. This is a picture of our clinical pipeline. As I noted, we are pursuing melanoma, cervical cancer, head and neck, and non-small cell. We are also moving the product into an earlier line with in combination with anti-PD-1s to try and offer something very strong and potent to the patients. We have a number of collaborations, and a lot of our new indications are being evaluated through the collaborations. So of course, we work with um, National Cancer Institute. We also have extensive collaborations with Moffitt and MD Anderson. And some of the new indications we're exploring with MD Anderson are ovarian and sarcomas, as a matter of fact, as well as pancreatic cancers. In case of melanoma, we have uh, the clinical study that is ongoing is shown here. Um, the study itself has cohorts one and two. Cohort one was an investigation of the original manufacturing process that we had licensed from NCI. We call that Gen 1. And cohort two is an investigation of our own manufacturing process that has been developed at IOVANCE, the 22-day manufacturing process. And we wanted to compare those two cohorts and make sure we see responses after having changed the manufacturing process. Cohort three allows for retreatment. It's really more of a research cohort for us to understand whether retreatment can add additional value to the patients. The endpoints are appropriate oncology endpoints, efficacy and safety, so ORR and DOR, and secondary endpoints are safety and efficacy. From an update perspective, we will be presenting extensive data um, from this study at CITSI and an oral presentation, as well as a poster. Um, this is data from December of 2017. We had cut at the time 17 patients worth of efficacy and 10 of them were efficacy valuable. Um, what is interesting from a patient demographic perspective is that the patients have a very high tum tumor mutation um, uh, bulky load. They are very large tumors. Patients have very large tumors at baseline. Um, it was about 140 millimeters of target lesion, some of diameters, which is quite impressive in terms of the tumor load, so very bulky disease. Most patients had seen anti-PD-1 and progressed through anti-PD-1 as well as anti-CTLA-4. Um, we didn't report it on this slide, but we have also reported that if they have had a BRAF mutation, most had seen a BRAF plus MEK, as a matter of fact. Um, as I noted, the sum of diameters is quite impressive. The patients do have mutations in BRAF, and what you can see is that um, uh, the baseline LDH is quite high, so there is one to two times increase as well as over two times increase. Over half the patients have elevated LDH. That's a poor marker for survival in general. And then the mean number of uh, target and non-target lesions is uh, well over you know, three, which is, again, a marker for very late-line patient population. Median prior therapies, by the way, was around 3.6. From treatment emergent adverse events, which is over 30%, what we were looking for was if there is a difference between what we are doing compared to what Rosenberg has seen, um, just from a, a historical perspective, the TEAEs typically are associated with the chemotherapy, which is cyclophosphamide fludarabine, as well as the use of IL-2. So there didn't seem to be any anomalies compared to what has been seen with TIL therapy before. Um, this is a swimmer's lane of, of the patient responses. What you can see is uh, the patients that responded, they typically show a response by the first assessment. And on, on, in cases, you can see a deepening of response in case of patient number one over the course of time. So by the second assessment, you might be able to see a response. We saw a disease control rate of 80%, and the time to response was fairly short in general. This is a waterfall uh, plot of the patients that um, had, were efficacy valuable. Mean number of TILs that were infused was around 34 billion. Mean number of IL-2 uh, doses that were administered was around 4.5, so most patients tolerated IL-2 administration fairly well. 
uh, patients with BRAF mutation are shown as a star on the bars. So what you can see is response or lack thereof is not correlated with BRAF mutation. Patients may respond either way. So officially objective response rate um, was 40%. Disease control rate was at 80%. And we had one patient that the best response was PD and one that was non-evaluable. Um, and again, all the efficacy cases of patients had received prior anti-PD-1 and PROGRESS and anti-CTLA-4. Um, just wanted to show you a patient scan. This shouldn't look surprising. A lot of you might have seen patient scans, so the patients seem to um, have uh, various lymph nodes or, or um, lesions that are uh, going away over time fairly quickly over the course of 18 weeks, for example. I'll now switch over to cervical cancer. As I said, for melanoma, we'll provide our updated data at CITSI. In case of cervical cancer, um, I just want to also highlight the prevalence in U.S. and global. In U.S., we have about a, a much better control. There's about 13,000 of new cases of uh, cervical cancer, and 4,000 patients die on an annual basis. Globally, however, this is a much larger problem, and the death rate is much, much higher, unfortunately. Recently, a product was approved as accelerated approval, which is Keytruda, for cervical cancer, with an overall response rate of 14% per the label. Um, their data from Steve Rosenberg was based on 18 patients' worth of data. Um, of them, five of them were responders. Two of the patients had gone into a deep, uh, deep response, complete response, and at 53 months of follow-up, as well as 67 months of follow-up, the two patients remained in CR. So this is what was the, the basis for us starting a cervical cancer study. The study design is shown here. It's a uh, Simon's two-stage design. Um, a certain number of responses need to be seen for the study to continue and get expanded. Endpoints are, again, appropriate oncology endpoints of efficacy and, and safety. And we have reported that we have uh, started patient dosing uh, late last year, and we continue dosing in, in Europe as well. In non-small cell lung cancer, uh, we know that the, the, the uh, landscape is quite broad. It's a very large indication. There has been great uh, available therapies uh, entering the market, particularly the combination of chemotherapy as well as Keytruda that has shown really great responses. So this is a space we're interested in, and we are pursuing it with uh, two separate studies. One is a collaboration with Moffitt, Moffitt Cancer Center. They showed some preliminary data at a World Lung Conference just about a month ago. And a, an IOVANCE-initiated study, which is a combination of TIL plus anti-PD-1, PD-L1, Durvalumab, is in collaboration with MedImmune and is ongoing so at this point. The study design from Moffitt's study is shown here. Uh, it is in PD-1 and PD-L1 naive, but once they enter the study, uh, the tumor is resected and, and stored. And so I call this a tumor banking model. Um, then they expose the patient to up to four cycles of nivolumab and confirm progressors. If the patient is responding, they continue on nivolumab. If the patient is not responding, then they would be shifted over to receive their TIL product. And what they showed in the, in the presentation at the World Lung Conference was that the patients were all primary refractory to nivolumab. In other words, they had zero responses to nivolumab which is a very bad patient population. And then they, they treated the patients with TIL. So our process is different than Moffitt's process. We don't do tumor banking. Uh, we have a short process, and we resect the tumor, and we immediately treat the patient with the 22-day manufacturing product that we have. A uh, company-sponsored study that is TIL plus Durvalumab is shown here. It's a single-arm study of 12 patients. Um, inclusion exclusion criteria is shown, and again, primary endpoint is efficacy, and uh, secondary safety and efficacy as well. Um, where else are we going with TIL? We certainly want to look at combinations in earlier lines. So that's our future direction. We started a study called, we call it fondly as a basket study, um, where we are looking at PD-1 and PD-L1 naive patients, and we are exposing them to TIL plus uh, pembrolizumab or Keytruda. And one cohort is in non-small cell lung cancer in a late line, so subsequent to anti-PD-1, we are offering them TIL, fairly similar to what we are doing in uh, metastatic melanoma uh, program. This study is just activated, and one side is active, and it's just uh, in startup uh, right now. From a research perspective, what we are interested in is to look at expansion of TIL platform. We really believe that this is a platform for multiple indications in solid tumor setting. We are looking at making more potent TILs, both by genetic modification as well as selection. Uh, we also have looked at shifting the equilibrium in terms of the growth of cells using various co-stimulants such as OX40 and 41BB. Um, we have published some of our work before, and our work on PD-1 selected TIL will be presented also at CITSI. 
Um, to sum it up in uh, terms of uh, milestones in 2018, uh, thinking about manufacturing, we have transitioned over all of our trials into this Gen 2 manufacturing process. We have started multiple trials with the Gen 2 manufacturing process. We continue process optimization to prepare for commercialization with this new process that we have developed. On the clinical side, we have continued enrollment in metastatic melanoma. We have advanced our head and neck and cervical studies, and we are pursuing new indications, including ovarian and sarcomas. We are also moving into earlier line of therapy with TIL plus anti-PD-1. We will um, present our melanoma data, as I noted, uh, shortly at CITSI. From a regulatory perspective, we are global. We are running our studies globally, and in fact, we have taken our manufacturing process and tech transferred both in multiple sites in US and EU. So the process is very robust, and uh, we have sites, multiple sites in various countries in EU activa activated and enrolling. We have a number of partners, both academic institutions as well as CMOs. We work very closely with our CMOs, and we think those relationships are particularly important in progress of the product into the market. With that, I thank you for your attention, and I can answer questions afterwards. Thank you.